Section One of the Seen and the Unseen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. The Seen and the Unseen by Richard Marsh. One. A Psychological Experiment the conversation had been of murders and of suicides it had almost seemed as if each speaker had felt constrained to cap the preceding speaker's tale of horror as the talk went on mr howitt had drawn farther and farther into a corner of the room as if the subject were little to his liking now that all the speakers but one had quitted the smoking-room he came forward from his corner in the hope possibly that with this last remaining individual who like himself had been a silent listener he might find himself in more congenial society dreadful stuff those fellows have been talking mr howitt was thin and he was tall he seemed shorter than he really was owing to what might be described as a persistent cringe rather than a stoop he had a deferential almost frightened air his pallid face was lighted by a smile which one felt might in a moment change into a stare of terror he rubbed his hands together softly as if suffering from a chronic attack of nerves he kept giving furtive glances round the room in reply to mr howitt's observation the stranger nodded his head there was something in the gesture and indeed in the man's whole appearance which caused mr howitt to regard him more attentively the stranger's size was monstrous by him on the table was a curious-looking box about eighteen inches square painted in hideously alternating stripes of blue and green and yellow and although it was spring and the smoking-room was warm he wore his overcoat and a soft felt hat so far as one could judge from his appearance seated he was at least six feet in height as to girth his dimensions were bewildering one could only guess wildly at his weight to add to the peculiarity of his appearance he wore a huge black beard which not only hung over his chest but grew so high up his cheeks as almost to conceal his eyes mr howitt took the chair which was in front of the stranger his eyes were never for a moment still resting as they passed upon the bearded giant in front of him then flashing quickly hither and thither about the room do you stay in jersey long No the reply was monosyllabic but though it was heard so briefly at the sound of the stranger's voice mr howitt half rose grasped the arm of his chair and gasped the stranger seemed surprised what's the matter mr howitt dropped back on to his seat he took out his handkerchief to wipe his forehead his smile which had changed into a stare of terror on its reappearance assumed a sickly hue nothing only a curious similarity similarity what do you mean whatever mr howitt might mean every time the stranger opened his mouth it seemed to give him another shock it was a moment or two before he regained sufficient control over himself to enable him to answer your voice reminds me of one which i used to hear it's a mere fugitive resemblance whose voice does mine remind you of a friend's what was his name his name was cookson mr howitt spoke with a perceptible stammer cookson i see there was silence for some cause mr howitt seemed on a sudden to have gone all limp he sat in a sort of heap on his chair he smoothed his hands together as if with unconscious volition his sickly smile had degenerated into a fatuous grin his shifty eyes kept recurring to the stranger's face in front of him it was the stranger who was the next to speak did you hear what those men were talking about yes they were talking of murders yes i heard rather a curious story of a murder as i came down to weymouth in the train it's a sort of talk i do not care for no perhaps not but this was rather a singular tale 
it was about a murder which took place the other day at exeter mr howitt started at exeter yes at exeter the stranger stood up as he did so one realized how grotesquely unwieldy was his bulk it seemed to be as much as he could do to move the three pockets in the front of his overcoat were protected by buttoned flaps he undid the buttons as he did so the flaps began to move something peeped out then hideous things began to creep from his pockets efts newts lizards various crawling creatures mr howitt's eyes ceased to stray they were fastened on the crawling creatures the hideous things wriggled and writhed in all directions over the stranger the huge man gave himself a shake they all fell from him to the floor they lay for a second as if stupefied by the fall then they began to move to all four quarters of the room mr howitt drew his legs under his chair pretty creatures aren't they said the stranger i like to carry them about with me wherever i go don't let them touch you some of them are nasty if they bite mr howitt tucked his long legs still further under his chair he regarded the creatures which were wriggling on the floor with a degree of aversion which was painful to witness the stranger went on about this murder at exeter which i was speaking of it was a case of two solicitors who occupied offices together on four street hill mr howitt glanced up at the stranger then back again at the writhing newts he rather gasped than spoke four street hill yes they were partners the name of one of them was rolled andrew rolled by the way i like to know with whom i am talking may i inquire what your name is this time mr howitt was staring at the stranger with wide open eyes momentarily forgetful even of the creatures which were actually crawling beneath his chair he stammered and he stuttered my name's howitt you'll see it in the hotel register howitt i see i'm glad i have met you mr howitt it seems that this man andrew rolled murdered his partner a man named douglas colston mr howitt was altogether oblivious of the things upon the floor he clutched at the arms of his chair his voice was shrill murdered how do they know he murdered him it seems they have some shrewd ideas upon the point from this the stranger took from an inner pocket of his overcoat what proved when he had unfolded it to be a double crown poster he held it up in front of mr howitt it was headed in large letters murder one hundred pounds reward you see they are offering one hundred pounds reward for the apprehension of this man andrew rolled that looks as if someone had suspicions here is his description tall thin stoops has sandy hair thin on top parted in the middle restless gray eyes wide mouth bad teeth thin lips white face speaks in a low soft voice has a nervous trick of rubbing his hands together the stranger ceased reading from the placard to look at mr howitt are you aware sir that this description is very much like you mr howitt's eyes were riveted on the placard they had followed the stranger as he read his manner was feverishly strained it's not nothing of the sort it's your imagination it's not in the least like me pardon me but the more i look at you the more clearly i perceive how strong is the resemblance it is you to the life as a detective he paused mr howitt held his breath i mean supposing i were a detective which i am not he paused again mr howitt gave a gasp of relief i should feel almost justified in arresting you and claiming the reward 
you are so made in the likeness of andrew rolled i'm not i deny it it's a lie mr howitt stood up his voice rose to a shriek a fit of trembling came over him it constrained him to sit down again the stranger seemed amused my dear sir i entreat you to be calm i was not suggesting for one moment that you had any actual connection with the miscreant rolled the resemblance must be accidental did you not tell me your name was howitt yes that's my name howitt william howitt any relation to the poet poet mr howitt seemed mystified then to make a dash at it yes my great uncle i congratulate you mr howitt on your relationship i have always been a great admirer of your great uncle's works perhaps i had better put this poster away it may be useful for future reference the stranger folding up the placard replaced it in his pocket with a quick movement of his fingers he did something which detached what had seemed to be the inner lining of his overcoat from the coat itself splitting the garment as it were and making it into two as he did so there fell from all sides of him another horde of crawling creatures they dropped like lumps of jelly on to the floor and remained for some seconds a wriggling mass then like their forerunners they began to make incursions towards all the points of the compass mr howitt already in a condition of considerable agitation stared at these ungainly forms in a state of mind which seemed to approach to stupefaction more of my pretty things you perceive i'm very fond of reptiles i always have been don't allow any of them to touch you they might do you an injury reptiles sometimes do he turned a little away from mr howitt i heard some particulars of this affair at exeter it seems that these two men rolled and colston were not only partners in the profession of the law they were also partners in the profession of swindling thorough paced rogues both of them unfortunately there is not a doubt of it but it appears that the man rolled was not only false to the world at large he was false even to his partner don't you think mr howitt that it is odd that a man should be false to his partner the inquiry was unheeded mr howitt was gazing at the crawling creatures which seemed to be clustering about his chair ring the bell he gasped ring the bell have them taken away have what taken away my pretty playthings my dear sir to touch them would be dangerous if you are very careful not to move from your seat i think i may guarantee that you will be safe you did not notice my question don't you think it odd that a man should be false to his partner huh? oh yes very the stranger eyed the other intently there was something in mr howitt's demeanour which to say the least of it was singular i thought you would think it was odd it appears that one night the two men agreed that they would divide spoils they proceeded to do so then and there colston wholly unsuspicious of evil was seated at a table making up a partnership account rolled stealing up behind him stupefied him with chloroform it wasn't chloroform not chloroform may i ask how you know i i guessed it for a stranger rather a curious subject on which to hazard a guess don't you think so however allowing your guess we will say it was not chloroform whatever it was it stupefied colston rolled when he perceived colston was senseless produced a knife like this the stranger flourished in the air a big steel blade which was shaped like a hunting knife as he did so throwing his overcoat from him on to the floor he turned right round towards mr howitt mr howitt stared at him voiceless 
it was not so much at the sufficiently ugly weapon he was holding in his hand at which he stared as at the man himself the stranger indeed presented an extraordinary spectacle the upper portion of his body was enveloped in some sort of oilskin such as sailors wear in dirty weather the oilskin was inflated to such an extent that the upper half of him resembled nothing so much as a huge ill-shaped bladder that it was inflated was evident with something too that was conspicuously alive the oilskin writhed and twisted surged and heaved in a fashion that was anything but pleasant to behold you look at me see here the stranger dashed the knife he held into his own breast or he seemed to he cut the oilskin open from top to bottom and there gushed forth not his heart's blood but an amazing mass of hissing struggling twisting serpents they fell all sorts and sizes in a confused furious frenzied heap upon the floor in a moment the room seemed to be alive with snakes they dashed hither and thither in and out round and round in search either of refuge or revenge and as the snakes came on the efts the newts the lizards and the other creeping things in their desire to escape them crawled up the curtains and the doors and the walls mr howitt gave utterance to a sort of strangled exclamation he retained sufficient presence of mind to spring upon the seat of his chair and to sit upon the back of it the stranger remained standing apparently wholly unmoved in the midst of the seeming pandemonium of creepy things do you not like snakes mr howitt i do they appeal to me strongly this is part of my collection i rather pride myself on the ingenuity of the contrivance which enables me to carry my pets about me wherever i may go at the same time you are wise in removing your feet from the floor not all of them are poisonous possibly the more poisonous ones may not be able to reach you where you are you see this knife the stranger extended it towards mr howitt this is the knife with which when he had stupefied him andrew rolled slash douglas colston about the head and face and throat like this the removal of his overcoat and still more the vomiting forth of the nest of serpents had decreased the stranger's bulk by more than one half disembarrassing himself of the remnants of his oilskins he removed his soft felt hat and tearing off his huge black beard stood revealed as a tall upstanding muscularly built man whose head and face and neck were almost entirely concealed by strips of plaster which crossed and recrossed each other in all possible and impossible directions there was silence the two men stared at each other with a gasp mr howitt found his voice douglas andrew i thought you were dead i am risen from the grave i am glad you are not dead why mr howitt paused as if to moisten his parched lips i never meant to kill you in that case andrew your meaning was unfortunate i do mean to kill you now don't kill me douglas a reason andrew if you knew what i have suffered since i thought i had killed you you would not wish to take upon yourself the burden which i have had to bear my nerves andrew are stronger than yours what would crush you to the ground would not weigh on me at all surely you knew that before mr howitt fidgeted on the back of his chair it was not that you did not mean to kill me you lacked the courage you gashed me like some frenzied cur then afraid of your own handiwork you ran to save your skin you dared not wait to see if what you had meant to do was done why andrew as soon as the effects of your drug had gone i sat up i heard you running down the stairs i saw your knife lying at my side all stained with my own blood see andrew the stains are on it still 
i even picked up this scrap of paper which had fallen from your pocket on to the floor he held out a piece of paper towards mr howitt it is the advertisement of an hotel hotel de la couronne d'or st Helier's, jersey i said to myself i wonder if that is where andrew is gone i will go and see and if i find him i will kill him i have found you and behold your heart has so melted within you that already you feel something of the pangs of death mr howitt did seem to be more dead than alive his face was bloodless he was shivering as if with cold these melodramatic and indeed slightly absurd details the stranger waved his hand towards the efts and newts and snakes and lizards were planned for your especial benefit i was aware what a horror you had of creeping things i take it it is constitutional i knew i had but to spring on you half a bushel or so of reptiles and all the little courage you ever had would vanish as it has done the stranger stopped he looked with evident enjoyment of his misery at the miserable creature squatted on the back of the chair in front of him mr howitt tried to speak two or three times he opened his mouth but there came forth no sound at last he said in curiously husky tones douglas andrew if you do it they are sure to have you it is not easy to get away from jersey how kind of you andrew and how thoughtful but you might have spared yourself your thought i have arranged all that there is a kettle boat leaves for st malo in half an hour on the tide you will be dead in less than half an hour so i go in that again there were movements of mr howitt's lips but no words were audible the stranger continued the question which i have had to ask myself has been how shall i kill you i might kill you with the knife with which you endeavour to kill me as he spoke he tested the keenness of the blade with his fingers with it i might slit your throat from ear to ear or i might use it in half a hundred different ways or i might shoot you like a dog producing a revolver he pointed it at mr howitt's head sit quite still andrew or i may be tempted to flatten your nose with a bullet you know i can shoot straight or i might avail myself of this still keeping the revolver pointed at mr howitt's head he took from his waistcoat pocket a small syringe this andrew is a hypodermic syringe i have but to take firm hold of you thrust a point into one of the blood vessels of your neck and inject the contents you will at once endure exquisite tortures which after two or three minutes which will seem to you like centuries will result in death but i have resolved to do myself and you this service with neither of the three again the stranger stopped this time mr howitt made no attempt to speak he was not a pleasant object to contemplate as the other had said to judge from his appearance he already seemed to be suffering some of the pangs of death all the manhood had gone from him only the shell of what was meant to be a man remained the exhibition of his pitiful cowardice afforded his whilom partner unqualified pleasure have you ever heard of an author named de quincey he wrote on murder considered as a fine art it is as a fine art i have had to consider it in that connection i have had to consider three things one that you must be killed two that you must be killed in such a manner that you shall suffer the greatest possible amount of pain three and not the least essential 
that you must be killed in such a manner that under no circumstances can i be found guilty of having caused your death i have given these three points my careful consideration and i think that i have been able to find something which will satisfy all the requirements that something is in this box the stranger went to the box which was on the table the square box which had as ornamentation the hideously alternating stripes of blue and green and yellow he rapped on it with his knuckles as he did so from within it there came a peculiar sound like a sullen murmur you hear it is death calling you from the box it awaits its prey it bids you come he struck the box a little bit harder there proceeded from it as if responsive to his touch what seemed to be a series of sharp and angry screeches again it loses patience it grows angry it bids you hasten <sighs> he brought his hand down heavily upon the top of the box immediately the room was filled with a discord of sounds cries yelpings screams snarls the tumult dying away in what seemed to be an intermittent sullen roaring the noise served to rouse the snakes and efts and lizards to renewed activity the room seemed again to be alive with them as he listened mr howitt became livid he was apparently becoming imbecile with terror his aforetime partner turning to him pointed to the box with outstretched hand what a row it makes what a rage it's in your death screams out to you with a ravening longing the most awful death that a man can die andrew to die and such a death as this again he struck the box again there came from it that dreadful discord stand up mr howitt looked at him as a drivelling idiot might look at a keeper whom he fears it seemed as if he made an effort to frame his lips for the utterance of speech but he had lost the control of his muscles with every fibre of his being he seemed to make a dumb appeal for mercy to the man in front of him that appeal was made in vain the command was repeated get off your chair and stand upon the floor like some trembling automaton mr howitt did as he was told he stood there like some lunatic deaf mute it seemed as if he could not move save at the bidding of his master that master was careful not to loosen by so much as a hair's breadth the hold he had of him i now proceed to put into execution the most exquisite part of my whole scheme were i to unfasten the box and let death loose upon you some time or other it might come out these things do come out at times and it might then appear that the deed had after all been mine i would avoid such risks so you shall be your own slayer andrew you shall yourself unloose the box and you shall yourself give death its freedom so that it may work on you its will the most awful death that a man can die come to me here and the man went to him moving with a curious stiff gait such as one might expect from an automaton the creatures writhing on the floor went unheeded even though he trod on them stand still in front of the box the man stood still kneel down the man did hesitate there did seem to come to him some consciousness that he should himself be the originator of his own volition there did come on to his distorted visage an agony of supplication which it was terrible to witness 
the only result was an emphasized renewal of the command kneel down upon the floor and the man knelt down his face was within a few inches of the painted box as he knelt the stranger struck the box once more with the knuckles of his hand and again there came from it that strange tumult of discordant sounds quick andrew quick quick press your finger on the spring unfasten the box the man did as he was bid and in an instant like a conjurer's trick the box fell all to pieces and there sprang from it right into mr howitt's face with a dreadful noise some dreadful thing which enfolded his head in its hideous embraces there was a silence then the stranger laughed he called softly andrew all was still andrew again there was none that answered the laughter was renewed <laughs> i do believe he is dead i had always supposed that the stories about being able to frighten a man to death were all apocryphal but that a man could be frightened to death by a thing like this a toy he touched the creature which concealed mr howitt's head and face as he said it was a toy a development of the old-fashioned jack-in-the-box a dreadful development and a dreadful toy made in the image of some creature of the squid class painted in livid hues provided with a dozen long quivering tentacles each actuated by a spring of its own it was these tentacles which had enfolded mr howitt's head in their embraces as the stranger put them from him mr howitt's head fell face foremost on to the table his partner lifting it up gazed down at him had the creature actually been what it was intended to represent it could not have worked more summary execution the look which was on the dead man's face as his partner turned it upwards was terrible to see end of section one Section two of The Seen and the Unseen by Richard Marsh. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sonia. Two. The Photographs. Chapter one. The governor glanced up as Mr. Dodsworth entered. Anything the matter, Mr. Dodsworth? Rather a curious thing in connection with the photograph of the man George Solly. If you could spare me a moment, I should like to show it you. Mr. Dodsworth produced a pocket book. From the pocket book he took a photograph. It was the photograph of a man who was attired in prison costume. He was seated on a chair, and he held in front of him a slate on which was written in large letters, George Solly. Mr. Dodsworth handed this photograph to the governor. Well, Mr. Dodsworth, what is there peculiar about this? there is something about it which is very peculiar indeed sir to my eye if you will look at the photograph closely you will see that there is something behind the man mr paley brought the photograph nearer to his spectacled eyes i see a sort of shadow well you will notice that that shadow looks very much like a veiled figure as though a veiled figure was standing at the back of the man's solly exactly it does bear some resemblance to a veiled figure what then this sir that no one was standing behind solly no one and nothing i don't quite see what you are aiming at mr dodsworth i am aiming at obtaining your permission to take another negative of the man another negative why isn't this a sufficiently good likeness the likeness is not exactly a bad one though it is not a very good one either but will you allow me to explain sir the day on which i took that plate was for photographic purposes a very fair day solly said 
where the men generally do sit about fourteen or fifteen feet from the wall there was nothing between the wall and him i ought to have had nothing on the plate but solly what i want to know is how came that veiled figure there a <laughs> veiled figure you call the shadow a veiled figure don't you think that the resemblance is somewhat fanciful no sir i don't the focus is not quite right so that it comes out a little dim but i have not the slightest doubt that a veiled figure has been introduced into my plate as standing behind george solly's chair i should very much like to take the man again in fact you are a little curious eh i am not sure that i should be justified in allowing you to make experiments at prisoners expense i don't know why they want this man solly's likeness at scotland yard it is his first offence he is a good conduct man and i don't know that i am entitled to allow you to put him to unnecessary inconvenience but to put it on no other grounds the likeness might be very easily improved dr livermore had just come in from his rounds he stretched out his hand to the governor let me look at it he said mr paley handed him the photograph the doctor examined it do you mean to tell me mr dodsworth that there was nothing behind the man when you exposed this plate i do ask mr murray he was present at the time chief warder murray standing by corroborated mr dodsworth's word then what have you done to the plate since you exposed it you know mr dodsworth this looks to me very much like one of those so-called spirit photographs you know what i mean printed from two exposures and that kind of thing i know what you mean but i assure you doctor that that is a print from an ordinary development of the plate which i exposed in mr murray's presence it seems to me to be rather a curious thing how did that veiled figure get upon that plate quite so if what you say is correct it is a curious thing mr paley i think you might allow mr dodsworth to make another trial no harm will be done the governor gave his permission some days afterwards mr dodsworth came into the office just as mr paley had concluded his matutinal interviews with such of the prisoners as were reported and such others as desired to see the governor dr livermore had also just entered the office to sign the report after making his rounds well mr dodsworth inquired the governor and what is the result this time before showing you the result sir i should like to ask a question or two mr dodsworth turned to chief warder murray who had been present in his official capacity during the governor's recent interviewing you were present mr murray when i photographed the man george solly i was and you also slater mr dodsworth turned to warder slater who had entered with him warder slater allowed that he was mr murray where was solly sitting when i photographed him he was sitting where the men always do sit perhaps twenty feet from the wall was there anything behind him i mean any person or any object of any kind there was nothing could there have been anything behind him without your having been aware of the fact certainly not it was a sunny day half past two in the afternoon and i myself stood within a dozen feet of solly to the left of him slater is what mr murray says correct warder slater allowed that it was mr dodsworth turned to the governor i have asked these questions in your presence mr paley because the results of my second attempt at photographing the man solly have been so curious i availed myself to the full of your permission i made up my mind that there should be no doubt about the thing this time so i exposed three separate plates this is the result of the first exposure mr paley mr dodsworth handed the governor a photograph i don't understand you mr dodsworth is this a photograph of solly who is the woman standing at the back of his chair just so that is what i should like to know who is the woman standing at the back of his chair mr paley glanced up in surprise what do you mean mr dodsworth 
i mean sir what i say that i should like to know who the woman is who is standing at the back of his chair did you see a woman standing at the back of his chair mr murray uh, there was no woman mr murray says that there was no woman the camera seems to suggest that there was let me look at the thing the doctor took the photograph out of the governor's hand it was the photograph of a man in prison dress who was sitting holding out a slate in front of him on which was written in characters which were only too legible his name george solly behind the chair on which he was sitting stood a woman her pose was curiously natural not at all the rather death than move pose which is dear to the average photographer she rested one hand lightly on the man's shoulder and she was stooping a little forward as if she was curious to see what was written upon the slate which he was holding her features were not quite clear and the whole photograph so far as she was concerned was rather dim but there could be no possible doubt of the fact that she was there dodsworth said the doctor do you mean to tell me that you have not been trying some little novelty of your own in the way of spirit photographs upon my honour doctor no i looked at that negative directly i got home and when i saw that woman standing there well i declare to you that i felt queer i have brought that negative here and the other two negatives anybody who knows anything about photography will be able to see at a glance that they have not been tampered with since their original exposure the print which the doctor has is the result of the first and this mr paley is the result of the second exposure mr dodsworth handed mr paley a second photograph it was a repetition of the first only in this case instead of standing at the back of the man's chair the woman was kneeling on the ground at his side and was stretching out her hand and arm in such a manner that they screened the words which were written on the slate you see commented mr dodsworth she has concealed the prisoner's name do you mean to tell me seriously mr dodsworth that you wish me to take this as a bona fide portrait of the man solly here is mr murray and here is mr slater they were present at the time ask them i took the negatives straight home they are now lying before you on the table what you are holding in your hand was printed in the usual manner and in the ordinary course from the second plate which i exposed then do you wish me to infer that about the matter there is something supernatural mr dodsworth mr dodsworth shrugged his shoulders it is not for me to draw inferences i am a photographer it is my duty to lay before you the results of the camera that is a print from the third exposure mr paley mr dodsworth laid the third photograph before the governor really mr dodsworth this is too much do you expect me to take this as a portrait of the man george solly why there's nothing of the man to be seen quite so the woman has stepped in front of him and conceals him wholly do you wish me to infer that the man is behind the woman then they will require the magnifying glasses which sam weller alluded to if that portrait is to be of much service to them at scotland yard i repeat mr paley that i wish you to infer nothing that is the portrait of a woman which was not taken under ordinary conditions because when it was taken there was no woman there no woman that is who was visible to my eyes or to mr murray's or to mr slater's and it was broad daylight we saw george solly and george solly only but it seems that the camera saw something else and i believe it is a well authenticated fact that the camera cannot lie that does not look like an ordinary photograph mr dodsworth it is an extraordinary photograph mr paley it looks so dim perhaps it is because the woman was only dimly visible to the exquisitely sensitized plate that she was invisible to our less sensitive eyes you are in fact suggesting a ghost story mr dodsworth 
i am suggesting a possible explanation mr paley and i will suggest another the doctor was holding the photograph in his hand he was eyeing it askance i suggest that i bring my camera to bear let me try my hand at photographing this remarkable mr solly have i your permission mr paley the governor leaned back in his chair he drummed with his finger ends upon the table his manner became official i don't know doctor that we are entitled to make experiments upon this man we are entitled to endeavour to get a good portrait of him if we can without adjuncts i suppose that you hardly intend to send either of these negatives up to scotland yard you will have inquiries made into the matter if you do i don't wish to suggest anything in the least unkind but i am inclined to think that although a mere amateur i shall be able to obtain more satisfactory results than mr dodsworth the professional perhaps when i try the spooks will be sleeping so far as i am concerned i very earnestly hope that the governor will allow you to make the experiment doctor the governor delivered his decision the circumstances are peculiar ordinarily doctor i should feel myself bound to decline to accede to your request the prisoners are not here for us to experiment upon but i have received instructions from headquarters to forward to scotland yard a negative of the man george solly none of mr dodsworth's negatives are suited to the required purpose it becomes therefore my duty to procure one more suitable it is in the hope that you will be able to provide me with a more suitable negative that dr livermore i accede to your request end of section two Section three of The Seen and the Unseen by Richard Marsh. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sonia. Two. The Photographs. Chapter two. Well, I've done it. There were in the office, when Dr. Livermore made this remark, the governor, Mr. Dodsworth, the chief warder, and the doctor. You were all of you present when I made my little trial so as to the conditions under which that trial was made i presume that we are all agreed what i photographed was the man george sully there was no one else there to photograph upon that point there can be no doubt whatever is that not so mr paley certainly no one else was there that is within the range of your camera just so i mean within the range of my camera so that there can be no reason why the result should not have been satisfactory no reason with which i am acquainted none whatever are the results not satisfactory wait one moment and you shall judge for yourself as you are aware i went one better than mr dodsworth i exposed four plates as each plate was exposed i sealed it up in your presence without even glancing at it myself directly i reached home i forwarded the sealed plates to a firm in town to be developed i mentioned to no one that i intended to do so i have mentioned the fact of having done so to no one since i simply instructed that firm to develop the plates in the ordinary way to print six impressions from each and to return both prints and plates to me the results have only reached me this morning here they are there cannot be the slightest doubt that these are my plates that they have not in any way been tampered with that they have simply been developed by ordinary processes and that these prints are merely reproductions from the plates yet when i saw these prints i did what i think you will do i stared mr paley here is the result of the first exposure the doctor handed mr paley a photograph the governor directly he saw it gave utterance to an exclamation doctor you are dreaming i assure you i am not mr dodsworth allow me to hand you a print from the first exposure mr murray allow me to hand you one mr dodsworth you perceive that the laugh is now upon your side the photograph which the doctor had handed round was not the photograph of a man at all 
but of a woman she was costumed in ordinary feminine attire she wore no covering on her head she was seated squarely on the chair on which prisoners were wont to sit when enjoying the luxury of having their likenesses taken at their country's expense she was looking straight at the camera and in the eyes there was a certain defiance and upon her face a look of stern resolute determination which is not in general to be noted upon the countenances of those triumphs of the photographer's art with which we adorn our albums honestly doctor inquired the governor aren't you having a little joke at our expense or perhaps you have made a slight mistake in giving us one print for another are you aware that the portrait you have given us is not the portrait of a man at all but of a woman i am aware of it and of a woman who to my eye has the light of a great purpose in her face there can be no doubt that that woman was sitting in george solly's chair and where is george solly then that i cannot tell you but as mr dodsworth remarked the other day and i shall have to make my apologies to mr dodsworth it is a well authenticated fact that the camera cannot lie on this occasion it has seen something which was concealed from our less sensitive vision mr paley laid down the photograph with that acid yet courteous smile for which the governor was famous and where is the result of the second exposure is the woman still sitting in george solly's seat no she has left it and this time as you see we have at least george solly's face here is the result of the second exposure the doctor handed round another photograph in this the man solly was seated in the usual attitude holding out the slate and the woman was kneeling before him her profile was towards the camera and she had just rubbed out the name upon the slate at any rate the slate was blank isn't that a remarkable photograph asked the doctor i mean a remarkable photograph from any and every point of view just look at the expression on the woman's face and at the suggestion of complete unconsciousness on the face of the man she looks as though she could and would do anything he seems to be wholly innocent even of the knowledge of her presence there this photograph is in some respects not unlike one of mr dodsworth which makes the thing the more remarkable but i want you particularly to observe that the slate which solly holds is blank now i ask all of you whether at any moment during the time i was exposing the plates that slate was blank uh, certainly not declared chief warder murray the others by their silence acquiesced in mr murray's declaration if i could trust my eyes during the whole time i was exposing the plates the words george solly were there ostentatiously there upon that slate you see that in that print the slate is blank now look at this this is the result of the third exposure in the fresh photograph which the doctor produced a curious change had taken place the blank upon the slate was occupied a name was written on it from corner to corner it seemed that it had just been written by the woman because the handwriting was feminine and with her face towards the camera still kneeling on the ground before the man george solly she pointed at it with a sort of defiant rage as though she gloried in the fact of having written it and dared them to deny the suggestion it conveyed now what do you think of that cried dr livermore you will remember that these exposures followed each other at intervals of perhaps a couple of minutes just now the slate was blank now the blank is filled the name george solly remained upon the slate throughout the several exposures as far as we could see but george solly is not the name with which the woman during the couple of minutes which intervened between the two exposures has filled the blank mr paley was peering through his spectacles at the name which in the photograph appeared upon the slate it is certainly not george solly it looks like evan evan it's evan Bradell. 
the thing's as clear as day evan Braddle, so it is really doctor this is in its way remarkable but i venture to say that the most remarkable part is still to follow we had first of all the woman sitting on the chair on which if we can trust the evidence of our senses throughout no one but george solly sat then we had the woman having rubbed out the name upon the slate george solly now upon the chair then we had the woman having substituted the one name for the other george solly still upon the chair and now in this fourth exposure you will see that not only has the woman gone but george solly has vanished too and in george solly's chair is seated another man here it is look for yourselves it was as the doctor said in the fourth photograph the woman had disappeared there was the familiar chair but the individual who was seated on it bore not the least resemblance to solly to begin with this individual with the exception of the hat he was hatless was clad in commonplace civilian costume decorous frock coat and the rest of it but it was not only a question of difference of clothing he was altogether a bigger and an older man than solly and he dandled on his knee with an air of curious discomfiture the slate on which was inscribed in a clear feminine hand the name evan Braddell. while his hearers continued to examine the result of the fourth exposure the doctor delivered himself of a few observations while i do not wish to suggest that we are in the presence of a manifestation from the supernatural i do insist that we are at any rate so far in the presence of a mystery i doubt if any photographer ever before discovered that while he supposed himself to having been photographing mr brown he had in reality been photographing miss smith i want you to note one or two points which strike me about the affair and which may lead to a possible solution first of all there is the presence of the woman in mr dodsworth's original plate it requires no strong effort of the imagination to suppose that the veiled figure at the back of the chair is that of a woman in mr dodsworth's subsequent three plates the woman is certain in my first three plates she is if possible more certain still and just observe that mr dodsworth's woman and my woman are identical she has changed her dress but the woman is the same possibly mr paley you will be able to offer us an explanation of how it is that mr dodsworth and i should both of us have been photographing a woman whom neither of us have ever seen mr paley leaned back in his chair he looked up at the ceiling he pressed the tips of his fingers together and he preserved that silence which is golden it is to be noted that the attitude of the woman is throughout one of protection to the man and defiance to us of defiance that is to the manipulator of the camera she first of all in mr dodsworth's plate tries to hide the name upon the slate then she actually with her own person conceals the man in my first plate she confronts me boldly as if to give me to understand that it is with her i have to reckon then she rubs out the name upon the slate she writes another in its place and having substituted one name for the other she seems by a mere effort of will to have effected an exchange of men george solly is gone evan Braddle occupies his place she appears as solly's guardian angel resolute at all hazards to prove that she is on his side and she seems to be making frantic efforts to express her unwavering faith in solly's innocence even going so far as to point out the man on whose shoulders the guilt should properly be laid the doctor paused and the governor spoke with regard to dr livermore's fanciful explanation of the somewhat peculiar circumstances connected with these photographs and the doctor will excuse me if i say that i did not think that he was capable of such flights of imagination laugh away mr paley he laughs longest who laughs last quite so doctor quite so with regard to your guardian angel theory about a woman watching over solly and so on i may mention that a letter has been received in the prison 
addressed to the man solly which comes from a woman from a woman who is apparently his wife whoever she is she is if one may judge from the evidence of the letter itself certainly a remarkable woman and i am bound to allow that in view of recent events and of what we have heard from dr livermore this letter is in a sense a coincidence in pursuance of the powers which are invested in me to make such use of convicted prisoners letters as may appear to me to be justified by circumstances i will read to you this letter which has been sent to the prison addressed to solly the governor read aloud the following letter it sounded strange in his cool clear slightly acid tones one fancied that it had been written in a different spirit to that in which it was read my own dear noble husband god bless you sweetheart i hope you realize my dear that i am with you in canterstone jail not only in spirit but actually and in fact i am with you in the morning when the bell rings and you rise from your plank bed i am with you on the treadwheel love and i am proud to keep step at your side and i am with you when in the evening you lie down again upon your plank i lie down on the plank beside you and i creep into your arms as i used to do when i had you at home and as i will do when soon i have you home again my love do not think that i speak figuratively i have been with you all the time that you have been in jail i have been ever at your side i have seen all that you have done although i do not think sweetheart that you have been conscious of my presence i have kissed you many times upon the lips although i do not think that you have felt my kisses there but now that you know that i am with you always and ever and that i often kiss you watch for me dear husband something i am sure will reveal to you my presence and you will feel my kisses but do not think because i am ever with you in the jail that i am not outside as well because indeed i am there has come to me during this our time of sorrow i know not from whence or how a dual personality i am with you there i shall be with you sweetheart when you read this letter watch for me i shall be leaning over your shoulder as your eyes light upon these words and i am here watching and working to establish the truth and the truth is coming out i know whose is the guilt it is his whom we both of us suspected from the first and soon it shall be proved by his own conscience and by me so the time is drawing very near when your innocence shall be made known to all the world i would not say so if i was not sure god bless you sweetheart and god permit me to continue with you in your cell it will not be for long and god has been so good to us in spite of sorrows that i have the full assurance that he will not withhold from us this further boon my own dear noble husband i am the happiest and the proudest woman in the world because i am able to write myself your wife a queer letter observed mr murray when the governor had finished reading i should say off-hand remarked mr dodsworth that that woman must be wrong in the head the doctor smoothed his shaven chin with his open palm before he spoke i am not so sure of that but of one thing i am sure i am sure i know who is the original of the woman in the photographs the governor glanced up from the letter which he still held in his hand who is it the woman who wrote that letter george solly's wife the governor appeared to consider the matter for a moment that is a point that can be very easily decided murray go and fetch george solly here the chief warder departed when in the course of a few minutes he returned with the object of his quest it was seen that george solly was a young man of perhaps six or seven and twenty years of age the prison costume which he wore was not a thing of beauty but its ugliness was not sufficient to conceal the fact that he was a man of gentle breeding and not only of gentle breeding but of modest bearing he was fair 
with clear brown eyes and well-shaped mouth and chin not by any means the criminal type of man and he was a man of quiet fortitude despite that ghastly uniform there was about the man a certain dignity directly he had taken up the regulation stand at attention attitude in front of the governor's table mr paley held out to him a photograph solly whose portrait is that as soon as solly's glance fell upon the portrait which he took from mr paley his eyes moistened and his lips twitched has she sent it to me may i have it sir whose portrait is it solly but the man appeared unconscious of the governor's inquiry he continued to gaze steadfastly upon the portrait and he said as if he had forgotten that any one was present beside the portrait and himself in a tone of voice whose tenderness to a toneless pen is indescribable how came she to be sitting on that chair and what a strange look she has upon her face my darling in the presence of those iron-bound officials he kissed the face which was imaged in the photograph i don't think you can have heard my question solly whose portrait is that whose my wife's are you not aware of that has it not come from her for me no the governor held out his hand give it to me solly shrank back a little he seemed to hold the portrait with an intenser grasp then he gave it back to mr paley that portrait is the property of the prison i merely wish to know if you recognize the subject here is another portrait solly can you tell me who is the original of this solly stared as though he could not quite make out the purport of the proceedings he held out his hand rather doubtfully for the fresh photograph which the governor passed to him by way of the chief warder but when his glance fell upon the photograph he started and he stared and he stared and he started as though he could not believe the evidence of his own eyes it it can't be at last oh my god at last the man's emotion was intense but the governor paid no heed to that whatever he repeated his inquiry in his cool clear acid voice are you acquainted with the original of that photograph am i aren't i oh mr paley have they found it out have they discovered it was he am i to have my freedom is it known at last that i was innocent be so good as to answer my question solly are you acquainted with the original of that photograph certainly i am here is his name written on the slate it is evan Bradell from the first i suspected him i even suspected that it was his deliberate intention to lay the onus of his guilt on me god knows why i never did him harm is he in custody upon another charge or how comes it if he is in custody for the crime of which they found me guilty guilty me that i have heard nothing of it and that i am not set free the man's tones were hot and eager the governor's as ever were cool and clear and acid solly give me back that photograph that also is the property of the prison as in the case of the other i merely wish to know if you were acquainted with the original i would advise you solly not to buoy yourself up with any hopes that the verdict which has been pronounced against you will be revised or that the term of imprisonment which was allotted you will be diminished i have heard nothing which would lead me to suppose anything of the kind indeed i have heard nothing about your case either one way or the other since you were tried i merely sent for you here to put to you certain formal questions that is all as the words were uttered in the governor's judicial monotonous tones the man shrank back as though he had received a blow there is another matter solly which i wish to mention to you a letter has been received in the prison addressed to you it infringes one of the prison rules which requires that every communication intended for a prisoner should be signed in full with christian and proper names moreover the letter is couched in language which i cannot in some respects call proper nor calculated to increase your peace of mind while you are here however i am informed that your conduct has so far been satisfactory 
and i am therefore disposed to waive these matters upon this occasion but you must distinctly understand that upon another occasion i shall not do so mr moray see that this man has in the dinner hour the letter which has been addressed to him and the governor handed the chief warder george solly's letter end of section three section four of the seen and the unseen by richard marsh this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by sonia two the photographs chapter three they sent up a report to the commissioners it was rather a compound document it was drawn up by the governor the doctor and mr dodsworth in concert with here and there a word or two from mr murray while in a sort of postscript warder slater was brought in it narrated at some length and with a considerable amount of circumlocution in accordance with official traditions the story of the photographs the negatives went with the report they were submitted to the impartial judgment of the commissioners to take or leave just as they pleased mr paley was particularly anxious that in the report there should not only be no suggestion of the supernatural but that there should be a distinct disclaimer of any suggestion of the kind on this point there was a slight difference of opinion the doctor insisted that the things which had occurred could not have occurred without the interposition of something out of the natural he wished to insert in his portion of the report a gentle hint to the effect that they might have hit which hit would tend to the advancement of photographic science upon a novel force mr dodsworth had or declared that he had no theories either one way or the other he would have liked the report to have contained nothing but a bald statement of facts while mr murray however no one paid the slightest attention on this point to mr murray because while he had the smallest possible belief in human nature he had the strongest belief in ghosts as for warder slater what was warder slater's state of mind upon the matter may be better judged from a report which he made to the governor upon his own account a couple of days after the report had been sent the reports on that particular morning numbered only one that one was warder slater and the man reported was george solly warder and prisoner took up their positions before the court which was drawn across the room and on the other side of which sat the governor at his table the warder if small in height was large in girth a prodigy of stoutness the prisoner was tall and slender as regards physical proportions they presented a pleasing contrast the officer seemed for some cause or other to be not altogether at his ease the governor opened the inquiry well slater what is it man talking in his night cell sir to himself or to whom the officer fidgeted with batavian grace it's my belief sir he had someone in his night cell along with him someone with him in his night cell yes sir and it's my belief it was a woman a woman the governor looked at the culprit probably becoming for the first time fully conscious that that culprit was george solly just then dr livermore entered the office at the back he stood and listened the officer explained i was on night duty last night sir and i was going my rounds about half past one when as i entered ward c i heard sounds of someone talking i found that someone was talking inside of thirteen c george solly's prison number was thirteen c the number being that of the cell he occupied i listened outside of thirteen c and i heard two voices two voices yes sir two voices and one of them a woman's a woman's yes sir a woman's i heard it most distinct i could hear what they were saying they were regularly carrying on i heard solly say my own true love i heard the woman say sweetheart and a lot more like that as if suspecting the presence somewhere of a smile warder slater all at once became emphatic i'm willing to take my bible oath i heard it the governor regarded the slightly excited officer through his spectacles with that calm passionless official look 
which he was famous for he turned to the culprit solly what have you to say solly's reply was somewhat unexpected what mr slater says is true you were talking in your night cell to a woman i was i was talking to my wife don't trifle my man with me i suppose you mean that you were engaged in some little ventriloquial performance solly hesitated it was noticed when he spoke that in his manner there was a certain exultation a suggestion of suppressed excitement you will remember that some days ago i received a letter from my wife in that letter she told me that she was always with me in the jail and that i was to watch for her solly paused the governor made a slight gesture as of interruption but then seemed to change his mind and the man continued i did watch it seemed to me that sometimes i felt her touch that i heard the rustle of her garments that i even heard her voice but the consciousness of these things was such a faint one that i supposed my attention being so acutely strained that i had allowed myself to be deceived by my imagination until last night solly paused again this time the governor made no attempt at interruption last night i could not sleep i lay dreaming wide awake i was wondering where my wife was and what she was doing and whether she was thinking of me as i was thinking then of her when i felt a touch upon my lips and found that my wife was in my arms i don't think that i was startled because i had half expected that she would come to me in some such way as that but i was very glad we sat together on the side of the bed and she talked to me and i to her as mr slater says we carried on until mr slater entered yes said warder slater when i had had enough of listening and wondering whoever could be carrying on with solly i opened the door soft like so that i might catch him at it whoever it was and i saw solly sitting on the side of the bed and some one i couldn't quite make out who because i don't mind owning that i felt a bit flurried because how anybody let alone a woman could have got into solly was more than i could understand but i saw it was a woman was sitting by his side and she had her arms about his neck and he had his arms about her waist well the monosyllable came from the governor warder slater had paused well sir i just caught a glimpse of her and she was gone gone like a thing of air before i had a chance to open my mouth i don't mind owning that i didn't quite like it at that time of night and all but i says to solly who's that you had in here along with you and he says it was my wife i shall report you i says and i went outside did you hear any more talking no sir i did not although i stopped outside some time and listened and i came back half a dozen times and each time i listened but i never heard a sound the prisoner took up the tale she came back once and kissed me and whispered just one word and after that i fell asleep and slept until the morning the governor leaned back in his chair he seemed to be considering he regarded the prisoner intently the prisoner meeting his glance with perfect self-possession at last he said that will do take the man away and warder slater and the prisoner departed as they went out dr livermore came forward the governor turned to him is that you doctor have you heard that edifying little story what do you think of it murray you can go on that hint the chief warder also went the governor and the doctor were alone when they were alone the two officials dropped to a perceptible degree their official manner frankly paley i don't know what to think you don't mean to say that you believe in the genuineness of that story as it was told to us i repeat i don't know what to think you see there are not only those photographs and the woman's letter but there is something else besides paley i've been breaking the rules how i've been carrying a detective camera about with me and i've been taking a snapshot at that man solly whenever i got the chance you have have you 
it's just as well you didn't tell me or i should have been down on you my friend well and what was the idea never mind what the idea was i'll tell you what the result is the result is nineteen photographs and in each of them with the exception of two there's the woman you don't mean it i do mean it those photographs are my own property i've half a mind to lay them before the society for psychical research i flatter myself that they would constitute as neat a case for inquiry as that august society has yet encountered livermore none of that there'll be trouble if you do i'm only jesting i'm not likely to give myself away but i mean to keep those photographs i mean to write their history and i mean to leave them to my heirs and a ghost story to the ages seriously paley it's nonsense to suppose that i could have photographed a woman seventeen times if she hadn't been there to photograph she must have been visible to the camera if she was invisible to me and from being visible to the camera to being visible and even audible and tangible to solly and even slater it's but one step further and that's why i say referring to the story which solly and slater have just now told that i don't know what to think and candidly i tell you again i don't i tell you what i mean to do i mean to have that man transferred that's one way out of it certainly transfer the solution of the ghost story on to someone else's shoulders have you heard anything about the report our report i mean yes this morning hardinge's coming down to-morrow hardinge nice sort of man to whom to entrust a case like that might as well expect an elephant to dance lightly upon eggshell china blundering bull major hardinge the gentleman thus disrespectfully alluded to was no less a personage than one of the inspectors of her majesty's prisons as such he was a personage who as is well known ought to have been regarded by all properly constituted official minds with awe and respect to speak of nothing else on the morrow he appeared having scampered round the prison in his usual twenty mile an hour fashion he attacked the subject in hand in that tumultuous hearty way he had paley what's all this stuff and nonsense about those photographs i'm surprised at you pon my word i am may i inquire major hardinge why the governor was the official to the finger-tips again send up a cock-and-bull story like that to headquarters what do you think that we're likely to make out of it a ghost story there can't be the slightest doubt in the world paley that somebody's been playing tricks with you that's the general opinion at the office may i ask major hardinge if i am supposed to be the person who has been playing tricks on mr paley the inquiry came from dr livermore i'm not here to inquire who is or who isn't in fact i'm not here to make any inquiry at all the case upon the face of it is too trivial for inquiry we've decided to squash it but since i am here i may as well see this man uh what's his name solly just so it appears that there are some peculiar circumstances in the case of this man uh solly i shouldn't be surprised if you've got the wrong man here after all the wrong man major how do you mean oh, those wise heads at the quarter sessions have made a mistake one more example of the immaculate perfection of the system of trial by jury mind i don't say that this is so i say that it seems possible that it is so the circumstances as they exist at present and which are not to be disclosed to the man solly the major glared first at the governor then at the doctor these three were closeted together are as follows the other day a man walked into the yard and gave himself up for embezzlement the day before yesterday it was when they began to inquire into the matter it turned out that the thing of which he accused himself had taken place down here at beddingfield over the way there and was the very thing for which the man solly had been tried found guilty and sentenced to two years hard labour what is the name of the man who gave himself up the major scratched his head a uh, nasty name i know it struck me directly i heard it as being a nasty name 
the sort of name you'd rather be hung than have let me see i've got it here the major took out a bulky pocket-book and out of the pocket-book a paper here it is evan Bradle. that's the fellow's name i've known men commit suicide for less things than having to own to a name like that the doctor took something from his pocket it was a photograph do you see the name which is written upon the slate which that man holds eh do you see major the name which is on that slate the major took up the photograph he peered closely at it evan evan Bradle, isn't it is this the man that major you should know better than i you may have seen him i haven't but that appears to be his name of which fact i was unaware until you mentioned it if that is a likeness of the man Bradle, i think major that even you will allow that the thing is curious because that happens to be a print from one of the negatives which we sent to the commissioners and which was taken from the man george solly the major glared you are at that cock and bull story again in this age of enlightenment and you a medical man sir i'm surprised at you i really am i don't want to discuss the matter the office is willing to consider the incident as closed and i may say that i'm instructed not to discuss the matter a pretty thing it would be if it got about in the papers goes that canterstone jail upon my word there'd be a scandal i shouldn't be surprised if the commissioners felt themselves impelled to institute changes changes sir to 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 return to this man solly and the man uh what's his name Bradle. it it appears that this man Bradle tells a cock and bull story another cock and bull story major yes sir another cock and bull story there are always plenty of them in the air as you will learn for yourself when you reach my age as i was saying when i was interrupted it appears that this man Bradle tells a cock and bull story about being haunted and even persecuted by this man solly's wife in dreams and that sort of rubbish until she has driven him to remorse and that kind of thing in fact there seems every probability that the man will be found to be a lunatic i should like to bet two to one he isn't the major glowered at the doctor as though he could scarcely believe his ears bet sir bet sir do i understand you to say that you offer to bet sir you appear to have extraordinary notions of the proper method of conducting an official inquiry sir in spite of your sporting offer sir perhaps you will allow me to repeat although i have no desire to bet sir that i have a strong reason to believe that the man will be found to be a lunatic and i base that statement to a great extent upon the grounds that in my opinion every man who tells a cock and bull story and persists in it in spite of common sense is upon the face of it a lunatic the doctor deeming discretion to be the better part of valour contented himself with bowing so the major was free to air himself in another direction but although as i say it is my opinion that the man will be found to be a lunatic and the whole affair fall through still as i am here i may as well see this man solly and put to him a question or two solly was seen by the major the major asked him if his name was solly what his age was if he was married if he had any children what he had been charged with where he had been charged and such like questions and finally he asked him if he had any complaint to make of the treatment he had received in the jail solly replied that he had none then the major drew himself up in a manner which seemed intended to impress the beholders with the fact of what a very remarkable man he was he threw his frock-coat open and he thrust his thumbs into the armholes of his waistcoat there is another question which i wish to ask you solly have you ever been photographed do you mean in prison no i am aware that you have been photographed in prison the major glinted at the doctor out of the corner of his eyes i mean outside before you came to prison certainly several times you will understand solly that you are in no way bound to answer the questions which i am putting to you now 
i am only asking them for my own private satisfaction but have you any objection to tell me whether any difficulty has been experienced in taking your photograph difficulty in what way in any way have the photographs which have been taken of you been satisfactory solly smiled a little faintly perfectly indeed i have understood that i am rather a good subject than otherwise may i ask why you inquire i ask because the photographs which have been taken of you in the prison have not been satisfactory that will do you can take the man away i am glad that he has no complaint to make when solly had departed the major turned to the doctor i believe dr livermore that you are an amateur photographer of course the fact of your being a medical man explains that you are i am but my being an amateur has nothing to do with these particular photographs i have no hesitation in saying that regarded merely as photographs they are first-rate in your opinion doubtless the major's tone was dry he rose i mean nothing offensive to dr livermore but the commissioners object to experiments being made in her majesty's prisons in future you will please paley not to allow them the treatment to which that man solly has been subjected can scarcely be justified who is the man dodsworth who is responsible for some of the photographs have you employed him before mr dodsworth is a highly respectable photographer in the town he has been frequently employed in the prison and has always given satisfaction don't employ him again employ somebody else next time if you can't find anyone the commissioners will send you a man from town i'm going paley i think that's all i have to say and major hardinge shook the dust of canterstone jail from off his feet that night in canterstone jail something rather curious occurred it was very late not only had the prisoners retired they retired at eight as they should have done in the days when they were young but the warders had retired too they retired at ten and even the governor who of course retired when he pleased but who observed virtuous hours as a rule had sought his pillows with the rest it was the rule at canterstone when the prisoners withdrew to their plank couches for the day warders to withdraw from the actual precincts of the jail they occupied a row of cottages on the other side of the wall the night warders came on duty in list slippers they promenaded with more or less frequency the wards in the silent watches of the night at the absolutely sepulchral hour of two a m on the occasion which has been referred to a figure might have been observed stealing along the path which ran outside one of the wards in the direction of the governor's house the figure was not that of an escaped felon not at all the figure was the figure of a warder he appeared to be in considerable haste for he had not stayed to remove the list slippers from his feet and he moved along as fast as he possibly could he was great in girth with his lantern in his hand the governor's house was in the very centre of the prison when this warder reached it he rang the bell and he not only rang it but he gave it a mighty tug the bell like a surgeon's was a night bell it was hung in the apartment which was occupied not only by mr paley but by mrs paley too so that when the bell was tugged like that the lady could scarcely fail to hear it if the gentleman deemed it wiser to sleep on warder slater for the warder was warder slater had no necessity to give a second tug in a remarkably short space of time a window was opened overhead and a head came out the head was the governor's who's there warder slater sir what's the matter there's a ghost in ward c sir a ghost yes sir there's that woman in solly's cell again sir it is no slight thing for the warder of a prison to rouse the governor in the middle of the night or what is the same thing at so early an hour as two a m it is well understood that there are occasions on which the governor must be roused but the commissioners have not distinctly stated whether the occasion of the presence of a ghost is one of them perhaps the omission has occurred because a ghost is so rare a visitor even in a prison which sees strange visitors that the thing seemed scarcely worth providing against whatever may have been the governor's private opinion on the matter he contented himself with saying before he closed the window wait i'm coming and he did come 
slipping into some of his clothes with a degree of dispatch which would have done credit to the schoolboy who delays his rising from bed until he hears the breakfast bell some more nonsense later that was the governor's dryly uttered observation as he joined the warder well sir you will see for yourself sir when we get there governor and warder started off together towards ward c as they moved over the pebbly path the warder whose state of mind did not seem to be a state of perfect ease endeavoured to explain i've been in that ward a dozen times to-night sir i thought more than once that i heard the sound of someone whispering but i wasn't quite sure until i went in just now sir directly i went in this last time i knew that there was something up i stood outside of number thirteen's door and sure enough i heard that woman talking to solly and carrying on with him just as she was the other night sir i didn't hardly know what to do sir because i says to myself if i report the man the governor won't believe me then i makes up my mind to come and tell you sir so that you could come and see for yourself i don't know if we shall find her there now sir she may have gone but that she was there a couple of minutes ago when i came to fetch you i'll take my bible oath that'll do we shall see if she's there when we get there the governor's tone was not reassuring but then it seldom was his official tone was not reassuring warder slater heartily hoped that she would be there he began to be conscious that it was quite within the range of possibility that the governor might be disposed to make an example of a warder who routed him out of bed in the middle of the night to see a ghost which was neither to be seen nor heard they entered the prison which was itself a ghostly place to enter they went in by the round house and there it was not so bad but when they began to mount the cold worn stone steps which wound up between the massive whitewashed walls the darkness rendered still more visible by the lantern in the warder's hand one began to realize that after all there might be visions about canterstone jail was an old-fashioned jail built in the good old-fashioned days when stone walls six feet thick were considered a sine qua non in jails in the broad noonday glare the wards in which the night cells were were dimly lighted entering them at two a m one received an object lesson in egyptian darkness one had but to stretch out one's arms to more than span the flagstone passage and when one realized that on one side there was a six-foot wall and on the other surrounded it is true by other six-foot walls but none the further off for that lay the representatives of every shade of crime one did not need to have an abnormal imagination to begin to comprehend that it is not always the part of wisdom to laugh at the tales which are told of churchyards yawning and of the graves which yield their dead at canterstone there were in each ward four floors the ground floor the first floor the second floor and the third floor solly's sleeping place was on the third floor that farthest from the ground and nearest to the sky the governor and warder slater entered the ward at one end solly's cell being at the other directly they reached the landing the warder laid his hand on mr paley's arm do you hear sir she is with him still there was a note of exultation in the officer's voice which seemed all things considered to be a little out of place the governor made no reply he stood and listened the general stillness rendered any sound there might be still more audible that there was a sound there could be no doubt the governor listened so as to be quite clear in his own mind as to what the sound was it was the sound of voices unless his sense of hearing played him false the speakers were too which is solly's cell the governor put the question in a whisper in a whisper the officer replied number thirteen right the other end sir that's where they're talking he and the woman come along with me sir and we shall catch them at it the governor checked the impulsive slater darken your lantern you have your keys when we reach the door keep perfectly still until i give you the order then unlock the door and throw the light of your lantern into solly's cell warder slater darkened his lantern in the pitchy blackness the governor and the warder stole along the corridor they were guided by the sense of sound 
guided by that sense they paused at the spot where the talking seemed to be most audible is this the cell the governor's voice seemed scarcely to penetrate the darkness the warder's yes was but an echo the silence was profound except on the other side the door on the outer side of which they too were standing there was someone talking in the cell the speaker seemed to be two an attentive ear could catch the words which were being spoken i could not rest until you knew and so i came to tell you so that there might be an end to your suspense and that you might not need to wait until the morning for the news the speaker was a woman of a surety the speaker was a woman my darling this time the speaker unmistakably was solly then there ensued what warder slater had described as carryings on the governor's sensations must have been of a somewhat speckled variety as he played the part of eavesdropper to proceedings such as those because there could be not the slightest possible shadow of doubt that within that cell there were carryings on there came to them who listened the sound of a woman's voice uttering in tones so tender they fell like sweet music on the ear loves and sweethearts and my own own darlings and such like vanities and to her replied a man in tones as tender if not as musical who did his best to give the woman a fair exchange for her conversational sweetmeats of affection but when it came to kissing audible in its prolonged ecstasy on the outer side of that thick oaken door the governor seemed to think that it was time that something should be done now he whispered and almost simultaneously the key was turned in the well-oiled lock the door was thrown wide open and warder slater's lantern gleamed into the cell then there was silence both in the cell and out of it and the governor stood within the open doorway with the warder just in front of him a little to one side so as not to obstruct the governor's view and the lantern in his hand and both of these officials stared stared hard for in front of them stood solly in considerable undress and at his side it is probably owing to the governor's proverbial official caution that he could never be induced to say what was at solly's side to say positively that is it seemed to him it was a woman not such a woman as we meet in daily life but as it were the shadow of a woman it seemed to the governor that she was attired in robe de nuit solly held her by the hand the governor thought he saw so much but before he had a chance of seeing more she fled or vanished into air his eyes never ceased to gaze at solly's side and there was nothing there when there could be no doubt that the tangible presence of the something which had been standing there had gone the governor's voice rang out sharp and clear solly who was that you were talking to it was my wife your wife the governor stared there was a peculiar ring in his voice which probably no prisoner had ever heard in it before i will have you punished in the morning the prisoner smiled in his voice there was also a ring but it was a ring of a different kind no mr paley you will not because in the morning i shall be free solly paused as if to give the governor an opportunity of speaking but the opportunity was not taken so he went on my wife has come to bring me good news he turned he held out his arms as if to take some one within them but they could see no one there to take and he said good-bye until the morning wife he advanced his face as if to kiss some one and there was the sound of a kiss but they could see no one who could have kissed him then he turned again to mr paley crying in a voice which was half tears half laughter it's all come out at last Braddle's confessed the home secretary has procured a free pardon you will have it in the morning my wife has been to tell me so it is certain that the governor could not have had much sleep that night warder slater roused him at two a m and if when he returned to bed again he was inclined to slumber he had not much opportunity for the indulgence of his inclination 
at an unusually early hour he was roused again a special messenger had arrived from town bringing with him a communication from the home secretary for the governor of canterstone jail the communication took the form of that bitter wrong of which the system of english jurisprudence still is guilty the home secretary informed the governor of canterstone jail that her majesty the queen had been graciously pleased to grant a free pardon to the prisoner george solly for what he had never done end of section four